morning. So this morning, um, again, I'm Eric Sheffield with CRISP. Um, if anyone's interested, we can talk more later. I'm not a sales pitch about CRISP. Data harmonization and integration, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But we're really here today to, um, to meet Rafael and have a chance to learn about his background, um, his path into consumer packaged goods. He joined Danone about four months ago. So I have a couple of questions and things that we'd like to share. And I know that there's a large group from his organization here today. Um, interesting, as I was learning a bit, and you and I had talked a little bit last week, there were a few things that some of your um, former coworkers or folks had put out there that really struck me as interesting as I was trying to get a feel for kind of what you're about and somewhat of your approach here. And a few of the things were one that you're a disruptive marketer. And you and I had talked about that a bit in terms of how do you shake things up? The second piece was an entrepreneurial leader, which I'm sure everyone here will be very excited about as part of the Danone organization. And the third one, which is kind of near and dear to my heart because I come from the insights and analytics side is that you're very well known for leveraging insights and analytics to truly develop um, differentiated and well-informed brand strategies. So I think those are all pieces that will come together very clearly today. Um, so without further ado, we'd really love to hear a bit about your background, kind of what brought you to consumer packaged goods. And then also, you know, a few months ago, what brought you back to Danone and kind of a traditional um, CPG company, but leading up the North American unit? Yeah, well, thank you, Eric. And thanks, everybody, for coming today to spend some time with us and having an opportunity, give me an opportunity to share a little bit of my thoughts about marketing and my background. Um, you know, I'll tell you a little bit about my journey. Um, I actually am originally from Caracas, Venezuela. I grew up there. Uh, right out of college, I actually thought that I was going to have a career in finance. My first job was actually in corporate finance, love numbers, um, did that for about a couple of years, but very quickly realized that consulting was not for me. I really love to be in places where I can see the work that I'm doing coming to life. Went to work for Diageo, the spirits company, and Diageo is a company that really believes in building brands in the strategy department. And that's when I really understood what brand management and that function is doing. I really got to work very closely with them. And I realized that's what I want to do uh, with my career. I thought it was the best time for me to do my MBA. I came to the US. I always wanted to come here, live the American dream, raise my family here. Um, and then I had an opportunity to go and work for, for Coke. I wanted to go and work for a company that I felt that was best in class in marketing. And then I literally blink and 20 years had passed and I had been there uh, for that time. And uh, uh, I had nothing but good things to say about the company. They had a wide range of roles. I started working on brands that were very scrappy, small, very entrepreneurial. Then I had opportunities to have global assignments. Then I had the opportunity to lead big brands like Coke, uh, Diet Coke and Coke Zero. And then my last role was leading the T portfolio there, which was a, a full GM role. I thought it was the right time for me to try something different. So I went to work at uh, Dunkin' as a chief marketing officer. Fascinating industry, moves very, very fast. About 30% of the transactions are happening, you know, via your, your cell phone. Um, you know, but very quickly, I also realized that I miss consumer packaged goods. Uh, I love the industry. I think that consumer packaged goods has a very good balance of very, very strong focus on brand building, a good balance of a strategy and execution. And um, like you were saying, I, I try to think about myself as a brand owner and uh, in this industry, you know, brands are at the heart of everything that we do. And I really miss that. So I couldn't be more uh, humble and excited to be part of Danone. I mean, obviously this is a purpose-driven company, a company that really believes to bring health through food, uh, incredible culture and talent. And uh, I, I couldn't be more excited to be leading the yogurt portfolio. I always have seen yogurt as a carrier of very good benefits for consumers. And I think that yogurt is incredibly well positioned, you know, to have a lot of uh, growth for the future. So I have an incredible team and I couldn't be more excited to be here. No, thank you in terms of the background. Um, as you and I mentioned earlier, you've, since you've been here, you've had a chance to travel around the country a little bit. Is there anything that stood out to you in terms of meeting people kind of across between Colorado, um, New York, you know, different areas in terms of as you've met the teams, is there anything consistent or any differences as well that you see across the regions? Yeah, I think that probably more similarities than differences. I think that the company has done a very good job, especially after the pandemic, of uh, really integrating a lot of the functions that are, have, that are in Colorado and the teams that are in Colorado more into the businesses. So if you think about my team, for example, 50% of my team sits in Colorado, 
50% of my team seems, sits in New York. Uh, I have been, one of the things that I have found very energizing is just see how much people believe in the purpose of the company and in our brands. And I think that's something that I can sense the energy that people have towards uh, the, the brands and, and the purpose that we have as a company. And, and maybe the last thing is to have fun. Um, I have been, you know, Danone is a, is a company that works hard, but we also have a lot of fun. You know, we just came out of a big event in Vegas where we had an opportunity to present our plans. Uh, and I was uh, one of the judges on a lip sync competition. And I was like, wow. I mean, like the amount of talent that we have just doing that in the company is incredible. So this is a company that I think that has a very, very strong culture. And I have found that very, very energizing. That's great. And that's not the talent that goes on a resume, right? That's right. Um, so, you know, you've talked about your career as you've worked at different organizations. But as we talked about, you know, you've always focused on growth and kind of strategies for innovation, renovation, and keeping things current. So what have some of your approaches been doing that for smaller brands versus maybe some, you know, global icons like Diet Coke and so forth that you've taken all over the world? Yeah, you know, my experience is that I, I think that probably there's more similarities than differences in the way that you need to think about a smaller and big brands, because I think that fundamentally the discipline as to how you want to drive growth is very similar. I mean, the first thing that you need to do is to look at what's happening outside, have an external view. And, and what I like to do is to look at what's happening with a category, how, how are the revenue maps and, and how is a category structured and what is growing in the category. Then I want to try to understand what's happening with the consumer, right? I mean, what are the need states, how consumers are segmented, then what's happening with the competition, really benchmark ourselves versus the competition. And that's for me, the external view. That's going to give you a very good perspective of what's happening outside, where is the growth coming? And then you essentially need to look at yourself in the mirror and you need to look internally. And then you need to start to look at, based on everything that is out there, how the category is growing, how consumers are moving forward into the future, how am I positioned? I mean, like, are my brands really uh, making sense? And my, my brands really positioned in a way that are going to connect and help me to capture those opportunities? And usually the answer is uh, maybe. Um, and you need to then take a look inside and you need to optimize the positioning of your brands. And that means essentially think about the way that your brands are positioned from an image perspective, your innovation agenda, how you're thinking about different occasions. And that's going to force you to update a lot of the positioning of the brands and then go after those opportunities. That to me is very similar whether you're managing a large or a small brand. The difference is the amount of risk that you can take and how much you can stretch the brands. If you're managing a big, very large, iconic brand that has been around for a long time, obviously the brand has a lot of equity and you need to be very careful, right? You need to balance moving into the future and you need to stay true to the essence of that brand. If you're managing a very small brand that probably has not been around for a long time, you have more latitude to completely change the game for that brand without thinking as much about the previous equity of the brand. Maybe a good example of that is what the team here has done with the brand Oikos. I mean, I think that that's a brand that is relatively recent. The team has found an incredible way to really look at what's happening in the yogurt category. If you think about the need to have higher protein and how that brand essentially started to transform itself into being very, very different versus the competition. Think about having a package that is extremely distinctive in a category that tends to be very much uh, similar from a packaging design perspective, uh, focusing on delivering very high protein content and having an innovation agenda that is going to be different than the competition. And the only problem that we have with Oikos right now is that we cannot produce enough because that's how well that brand is doing in the marketplace. So that's an example for me of how you think about really modernizing and adjusting brands based on how the category is evolving. Which in one sense, right, no, and thank you, is a, is a problem that everybody wants, but the flip side is, right, that's lost opportunity. And, you know, what are the risks that come with that as well, right? So it's, it's almost kind of be careful what you ask for, because when you get there, right, it presents new challenges. What about from a global perspective? I know you talked about brands that may be, um, you know, smaller and more entrepreneurial versus large brands. Given your experience on a global basis, how have you seen things in terms of um, how you approach different markets, different regions, and how does innovation fall into that as well in terms of engagement and renovation? Yeah, I, um, I think that the way to think about that is that, again, there's more similarities than differences. There's fundamental universal insights that are very important to take into consideration, but the way that you execute those universal insights it has to be uh, nuanced 
based on the different realities of the different geographies. You know, when I was working, for example, at Coke and I was leading Sprite uh, globally, it's a brand that is focusing on connecting with uh, teenagers, first and foremost. And if you think about the universal insights, uh, no matter what generation you are coming from, uh, teenagers will always have this balance of trying to express their individuality and try to belong to a group. And that insight is the same, no matter where you are in the world. But how does manifest itself is a little bit different, right? In the US, for example, I'll give you this, the, in the case of Sprite, the two biggest markets are were China and, uh, and the US. And think about markets that are probably very, very different. In the US, you lean a lot more into that individuality, right? I mean, there's a lot of more self-expression. In China, you know, there's a little bit of more the feeling of uh, the importance of belonging to a community. And you need to have a little bit of more permission to really express that individuality. And you need to wait a little bit more for the group to express that so that you can tap in. So we were able to, for example, launch a global campaign that was based on that universal insight. Uh, but the way that we executed it was very different depending on the geography. So I think that that's where the magic happens. You need to make sure that you're not trying to do something that is the same for everybody strategically focus on universal insights and then how you execute them has to be nuanced. No, thank you. Uh, how does it also, when you think about um, rejuvenating brands and you did talk about, you know, Diet Coke, you know, and Sprite, from an innovation pipeline perspective, how do you approach um, innovation kind of as a process, but also as kind of an end to a means? How do you approach that? Yeah, the, the way that I think about innovation is at the end of the day, innovation is about solving problems or delivering value to consumers, right? And that's how we need to think about, you know, what we think about innovation. When I was working on Diet Coke, you know, that was an interesting assignment because it was a brand that has been, had been declining for almost 10 years. Uh, the brand had been launched uh, very much in the 1980s, uh, recruited a generation of consumers. That generation of consumers were getting older. And the fundamental problem with that brand is that uh, it had not done a good job really keeping up with the times to recruit a new generation of consumers. So in that particular case, you know, we try to understand what are the barriers that we need to overcome to recruit new consumers. And it came down to really modernizing the image of the brand and uh, addressing some of the taste uh, concerns that consumers had. And that essentially led us to focus on renovating the image of the brand, having an innovation agenda and tapping into new occasions. In the innovation agenda, it was all about staying true to what the brand is and the core of Diet Coke because you have consumers that absolutely love that brand, um, you know, and drink about 13 per week. I mean, it's essentially like almost their wingman, if you think about that brand. Um, and then we had innovation that was designed to attract new consumers that uh, was using a different type of taste uh, through new flavors under the brand to attract new consumers into the brand. So. You need to think always about innovation as a way to solve a problem and to add value to consumers. In this case, we're solving the problem of addressing the taste concern and adding value to consumers by delivering something that will give them a pick me up, but it will have a, a, a very unique taste profile that was more experienced to recruit new consumers, millennials. Great. Thank you. Um, so of, you know, of the things that you've done in the past, and you talked about, you know, Sprite, you know, in terms of renovation, Diet Coke, as you were just talking about, and other brands, is there something that stands out to you as being, say, kind of the most interesting or challenging one that you've worked on, but at the same time, to kind of tag onto what you said, what's been the most fun as well, kind of going through the process from, you know, from beginning to end? Yeah, I have a few, honestly, it's hard to pick just one, but uh, when I was in my early years, just the opportunity to uh, help create the first energy drink portfolio that Coke had just when Red Bull was starting in the US. And uh, it was a little bit like the Wild West. You didn't have a lot of data. Category was moving fast. You have to move super fast. It was almost like being in a startup in a large company. Love that experience just because I learned so much about operating, you know, with a lot of agility and again, feeling like a brand owner and creating something completely from scratch. I love the Diet Coke turn around just because the, the pressure that we were under was significant. I mean, it's the second largest brand in North America, had been declining for 10 years. And just going through the process of thinking about how do I, it was essentially a two-pronged process. How do you stabilize the business first, focusing on driving frequency? And then at the same time in parallel, how you completely think about transforming the brand to recruit a new consumer base. So, and then seeing the fact that we were able to get it to grow again was, was very inspiring, I think, for everybody that worked in the project. And, and then the last one that I really love is 
eh, the tea portfolio eh, on Coke. It was a, a portfolio that was very indulgent, marketed as a southern sweet tea portfolio. And as a team, we have to come in and really modernize it, reduce sugar, eh, essentially move it into what we call authentic goodness and try to bring all the goodness of tea out and, and transform that portfolio. And you know, that portfolio was declining share. Uh, and when we left, he, he had like six and three quarters of, of growing shares. So, so I love those three three examples. I learned a lot and I grew a lot from those three experiences. Great. No, thank you. And is there one, is there something that stands out as you've gone through kind of the innovation process or brand rejuvenation, something that was kind of the most fun process that really just pushed you into new areas or that you just had a blast with? I think that maybe maybe the way I would the way that I would look to think about that, maybe one of my biggest learnings is more than any process or any innovation is just the culture that you need to have to have great innovation. And the culture, I think the people culture has to be all about making sure that you can take risks and that people feel safe to make mistakes and to learn from it. Because from my perspective, what is important is that you are creating innovation that is designed to address a business problem. The tactic and whether the innovation works or not is something that is going to be a process. Some are going to work, some are not going to work. The key is you need to put yourself out there. You need to be bold. You need to be willing to take risks. And people have to be willing to understand that some things are going to fail and some things are going to work. And then what is very important is that we have a learning organization that is able to take those learnings and to share them with them. Because what is what is great is to you know be bold, make mistakes. What is not great is to make the same mistakes two times. So that's when problems uh, really embed into the organization. So uh, that's what I have found. I think that we need to create an organization that is willing to take risk and where people feel safe uh, to make mistakes. Great. No, thank you very much. Um, before, I know we still have a few minutes. Where's Gina? So is there an opportunity to, is there an opportunity for Rafael to take any questions? I just know, yeah. So is there anyone that wants to pose a question? Um, there's, I know there's a large group from Danone here. Is there anybody that wants to pose a question now to Rafael? I won't make eye contact so it doesn't put anybody on the spot, but yeah, sir. So I think the question was, when you were working on Diet Coke, did you have any uh, concerns about kind of losing your core or alienating some of your core consumers? As you mentioned, that 13 and a half can yep. a week kind of population. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And I think that was, that was the dilemma that the company had been for a long time. You look at your established consumer base, and then you look at who you want to recruit, and you're trying to debate, do I focus on retention? Do I focus on recruitment? And you know, through my journey there, my learning and my perspective, my strong perspective on this is you need to focus on recruitment first. Like no brand is able to grow unless you recruit new people into the brand. And the most important thing is to understand how do I recruit new people into this brand? And then you need to disaster check against your core consumer base to make sure that you're obviously not completely alienating them. Now I will tell you on Diet Coke, what we found is that as long as you stay true to the essence of the brand, and you modernize it, you're going to be okay. The problem is if you're trying to do something completely different, right? If you, instead of moving from a silver can, you're going to move into like a yellow can, then people are going to go, what is going on here? But you need to maintain some of the equity of the brand and modernize it. Um, but that was our learning. And, uh, and when we did that, actually what we saw is that our core consumers absolutely love it. They were almost telling us like, for us, you can almost give it to us in a, in a plastic bag. And as long as you don't change the product, uh, we're going to love it. So that gives you a lot of permission to change a lot of the visual identity system and to innovate around the base brand. So, so that will be my strong recommendation. Always focus on recruitment first. You're talking more about baby steps to keep that core, but kind of making that natural migration, right? Yeah. And be bold. That's the other thing. You need to be end-to-end. -end. Like for a long time in the ECO, we tried to launch a campaign. We tried to change the graphics. And it wasn't until we took a step back and we thought in a very transformational way and we look at the whole thing end to end, you know, the image, the graphics, the campaign, our innovation, new occasions, and we bundled all of that and we did it at the same time that the brand really, really responded. Great. Thank you. Um, we have time. Yes, sir. You talked about the category competition, category competition consumers. Would you add a, th a fourth C, like culture? And... Yes. Can you give us an example of when you tapped into something that was happening culturally and you tapped into it and 
The answer is absolutely yes, absolutely yes. I think that that's, uh, a, you need to think about the culture and you need to think about what is happening there to make sure it's human in that you can understand the contextual context in, in the way that you want to think about establishing the brand. So absolutely, yes. So I think we probably, yes, yeah, sir, in the middle. Rafael, is there a, either a new capability or a new role that you feel you need, it, need in brand management in 2023 that maybe you didn't need in 2010 to 2015? That's a, that's a great question. Well, I think that obviously uh, technology is becoming more and more important for us. And I think that, uh, you know, getting very close to how consumers think especially from a social listening perspective, staying very close to that. I think that is very important. And oftentimes that tends to sit separately from the brand teams. And more and more, I believe that has to be integrated into, into the teams. And, uh, you know, things are moving extremely fast. And, um, you know, in the past, when the, the connection strategy was different, you know, the truth is that you control a lot of the messaging, right? I mean, like that was put out there. If you look at now, probably only maybe 10% of the content, if that, or 5% of the content that consumers are consuming is actually created by the brand owners. So we need to, we need to embed that a lot more, the content creation element and listening into the, into the brand team so that we can move with a lot of more agility in the way that we respond and we connect with consumers. We need to stop thinking about these very pristine pieces of content that we are creating to, con to connect with consumers because you know, Gen Cs don't even think about it that way. I mean, they, they grew up in a world where the majority of the content is created by consumers. So all these very elaborated like uh, content that we create it still plays a role, but it's probably a limited role in the way that we need to, we need to seize control. We need to give the brands to consumers and we need to be able to 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 have that more embedded in the in the way that the teams are structured right now, right, and it's about time and and um, time and reactiveness, right? And you talked about being very consumer focused, being able to turn things around, you know, quickly, and probably the good enough model, right, is probably also coming more into play. How have you seen that proposition in terms of you know the digital piece, right? The quote good enough, the balance of that versus timeliness. Yeah, I think that timeliness is the most important element in making sure that you can understand what is happening with culture. And I think that you need to let go of the brand and you need to err on the side of creating more content that is going to be aligned with the brand strategy. And you don't know which one of them are going to work or not work and you need to learn from it. But I think that the consumer centricity and the speed in which you need to move nowadays is, is the focus versus the the how pristine is the is the content i mean you can you you can essentially lose a very important opportunity to connect with consumers by trying to be either too perfect with the content or uh, too conservative in the way that you're seeking all the approvals in the organization to move fast so i think that we need to uh, drive agility empower people and we need to move very fast with pieces of content that probably who have a very low production value but it can really connect with what's happening with culture um, on a timely basis. Probably makes a lot of the marketers in the room cringe, but right, that balance. Um, I think we're kind of at time. So Rafael, I want to thank you on behalf of everyone for being our host today and for taking some time to talk with us this morning, share your background. And um, I know there's plenty of networking opportunities today that people will be able to grab you and talk further. So it's been my pleasure. Nice to meet you. Thank you, Eric. And thank, thank you. you, Linda, for the opportunity.